I thought Lloyd Alexander did the characters that he did in throughout all the books. I thought that he did a really good job. He made a lot of interesting characters, a lot of humorous characters, and a lot of char characters that make you think a lot about um, kind of almost like life. I feel like the books are kind of relatable just because um, there are so many different characters and they all have like different personalities but there's an element to each one that you can relate to every single character in the book. There's a part of you that's kind of like flute or flam in that you know sometimes you exaggerate a little bit too much or something and a part of you is like you know a lawn wee or you know like you just I don't know just, just there's something to each character that you can relate to. I just think it was kind of a part that was funny and then other parts it was more of action but I think it kind of fits in for a lot of different types, like it keeps you wanting to keep reading. Probably Taryn himself, I think he's probably one of my favorite characters, primarily because he's an assistant pig keeper, which is not really a glamorous thing, but he knows what his responsibilities and his jobs are as an assistant pig keeper, but then at the same time, like, he finds uh, time to go on all these crazy adventures with his friends and stuff, which I think is kind of awesome. In the Book of Three, in the very last scene when um, the Horn King comes after them, um, I like how uh, Toran just, like, you know, even though he's not noble enough to take the sword out, he actually tries, you know, defend himself. And basically even though it burns him but and then when the my favorite character comes along and just basically burns the guy's face off I guess that was probably one of my favorite parts. I liked how like at the beginning it kind of seemed like the characters like were kind of vague but then over time it seemed like you got to know them really well and so you just want to finish the story of all the characters. I think it's really an interesting book that from the way he wrote it, it kind of surprises you at points and sometimes you don't really see stuff coming and it's just really exciting. And he keeps making all these swords that look really nice and the blacksmith keeps telling him to break it on this, this stone or the anvil or whatever and all these really pretty swords keep breaking and he makes one that's just really ugly looking and he's about to cast it aside um, and the blacksmith says, no, I want you to test it on the anvil and so he goes to smash it on the anvil and the sword stays true. So I think that um, that's kind of an important lesson that beauty doesn't necessarily indicate how good something is. And I think that's an important lesson for about Terran himself, that he's not really a, a beautiful person, he's not really a glamorous person, but he still has like inner strength that makes him a quality character. Lloyd Alexander, America's High King of Fantasy. Although he would be best known for his tale of an assistant pig keeper, Lloyd Alexander's influence would spread far beyond the borders of his mythical land of Verdun. He was the first American who wrote high fantasy that the British that could stand up against the British fantasy. He put, he sort of put America on the map more solidly in the area of high fantasy. All of the really good fantasy writers owe some kind of a debt to people like Lloyd Alexander and J.R.R. Tolkien and certainly C.S. Lewis. And in fact, that's one of the great accolades that some of the British reviewers gave Lloyd is they put him in the same class as C.S. Lewis in some of those reviews. Um, now you, 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 you have made an impact, I think, when uh, the British uh, will deign to give you that kind of credit. I think he was among the first, not the only one, who took traditional legends and wove them into novels, uh, which had some, which were certainly adventure stories. They were plot-driven 
and they were quest novels. He established in the United States a really great foundation for the history of American fantasy and, and truly uniquely American fantasy and, and the tradition that built on other great fantasy writers um, that came after him, um, making it a part of, of who we are as an American culture. I think that his place in children's literature is firmly established. I think that he influenced a whole slew of fantasy writers. I think he wrote an Amer almost an American version of a classic kind of fantasy. I don't know if I can quantify how much influence he has. I just know when I am with authors and I say Lloyd Alexander, they all light up. Everyone's had that experience, those of us who are fortunate enough to read him as children, to, to know and fall in love and with his stories. And knowing how influential he was to me as a writer and a reader and a person, I, I have to believe that all those other writers were as well. It's amazing how he wrote decades ago, and yet children who may not even read him now are influenced by those who read him and keep writing. So that it's, he's like a grandfather of children's literature, that his offspring just keeps growing and growing. Lloyd never quit. He had all kinds of problems and all kinds of things kept happening to him, but he never quit. He never once failed to deliver in spite of all his difficulties. I think that's one of the things that I always remember about him. He was very, very uh, focused, concentrated. On January 30th, 1924, Lloyd Chudley Alexander was born in West Philadelphia to Alan and Edna Alexander. Lloyd's father, Alan, was born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica by a British father and a Portuguese mother. He immigrated to the United States where he met and married Edna Chudley. Edna's father, Harry Chudley, a native of England, had been bothered by what he called the excessive pretensions of the British and sought life in a less structured society. So he packed his bags and boarded a ship to America. When he arrived, he changed the spelling of his last name to make it appear more American. In that same spirit, when Lloyd was in high school, he decided to drop his middle name entirely. Lloyd does not like pretense of any kind. And he thought that Chudley was pretentious. He thought it was much simpler to be called Lloyd Alexander. And interestingly, Grandfather Chudley, C-H-U-D-L-E-I-G-H, didn't like pretense either. And he shortened his name to C-H-U-D-L-E-Y. And in that same sort of spirit, Lloyd got rid of the pretense in his name by simply removing the whole name. In addition to Lloyd, the Alexander household consisted of Lloyd's father, who was a successful stockbroker in Philadelphia, his mother, who was often busy with visitors and extended family, and Lloyd's older sister, Flo. When Lloyd was five years old, he started first grade a whole year younger than most of his classmates. Thanks to his father's success, he was sent to a private school in Philadelphia. However, when the stock market crashed in 1929, young Lloyd's life would drastically change. The Great Depression certainly had effect, an effect on the Alexander family. Um, Lloyd's father uh, was a successful stockbroker, and when the Great Crash happened, um, he kind of lost it all. Um, that necessitated the family moving outside from Philadelphia, which was the big fancy city and private schools, to come here to the suburbs of Drexel Hill, uh, where they had a, a little bit of a more modest life, uh, attend public schools, and Lloyd's father then took a number of, of different jobs to, to get by and, and earn, a li earn a living to support his family. In April of 1930, six-year-old Lloyd fell ill with pneumonia. He missed half a year of school, but it took even longer for him to fully recover. 
When he returned to school, he was forced to sit and watch as the other students participated in the physical activities, causing young Lloyd to be the target of many of his schoolmates' jokes. Lloyd didn't like school. He didn't have many friends and wasn't very social. Even within his home, he was often alone. It doesn't seem to me that he had close intimate relationships in his family. He knows his mom loved him, um, he loved her, his sister sort of watched out for him, he liked Flo, they weren't close. Um, he and his dad <clears throat> didn't throw footballs or go to baseball games together. Despite his lonely childhood, Lloyd found something that would help him through it. Books. His earliest memory is a clear picture of sitting and reading a book. Although no one else in his immediate family was much of a reader, Lloyd found books around the house and found that he could escape through their pages. His early reading was really nothing much more than decorations in the house. Uh, his parents thought that it would look good to have some books on the shelves at the house. So they went to a second-hand store and bought a number of books um, and put them on the shelves. And that, in many ways, was his salvation um, as a youth. He, he voraciously read all of those books and uh, was especially fond of uh, things like legends and stories of, of great Bering Do at the time, the uh, Arthurian tales, uh, King Arthur, Knights of the Round Table. Uh, all, those, all those stories captured his fancy as a young child. At a very early age, Lloyd would wander his house asking whoever might be there to read to him. Around age three, he taught himself how to read and he was reading well before he started first grade at age five. We're not talking picture books. This was um, picture books. There were picture books, but he would read longer books. Uh, and he said, I think that he read, before he went to school, he probably read 200 books. He learned how to read early, he liked to read, he found great pleasure in it, he found great satisfaction in it. Lloyd's love of reading along with his creative imagination led him to discover new ways to fully participate in the reading experience. One of these ways was something that he called the Eat and Read program. Eat and Read means if you're reading a book, there is a food, a food associated with it or a food that's actually mentioned in it. And for him to participate more fully in the reading experience, he wanted to be eating that food while he was reading. He'd read Robin Hood and he wanted venison, but they couldn't find any venison. But his mom kept looking until she found him a piece of venison. I'm not sure he had to do it with every book. I don't know if he did. But the idea of the participation at a different level, at a different sensory level, appealed to him, and he took it very seriously. It didn't take long for Lloyd to realize that he didn't like school. Thanks to his love of reading, by the time he started school, he was already well ahead of his classmates in many areas. Because of this, Lloyd was often bored and had a hard time paying attention. Although he disliked formal education, Lloyd Alexander learned how to learn and loved exploring through books. He would never lose that love of learning. Lloyd set the goal at a young age to become an author and then used his love of learning to work toward that goal. As far as writing goes, I guess I wanted to write from the time I was about 13. And of course, when I told my parents that, they were shocked and horrified. They said, this is the worst possible thing you could do. That writing is awful. You have a terrible life. It's just, just impossible. As it turned out, they were quite right, but I didn't believe him at the time. And I was bound determined that I wanted to be a writer. Well, he's going to high school. He's reading every day. He's writing. He's submitting short stories and poetry. He would never tell any of his teachers he was doing any of that. It was almost a, a pride thing. Uh, he, he helped draw the line between school and learning. And he loved to do what he was doing on his own outside of school, but, but he didn't credit school at all for helping him 
get any place intellectually or academically that he wanted to be. When he was starting fifth grade, Lloyd excelled on the achievement test and was moved up to the sixth grade. Since he had started school a year younger than the other students, this now made him two years younger than the rest. By the time Lloyd graduated from high school, he was only 16 years old and had to figure out what to do with his life. There were a few things that he thought he might be, that he might do when he was an adult. Um, and an archaeologist was the first one when he was very young. And then he thought he might be a cartoonist artist. And then he was the most serious about being a priest. Uh, and n not so much a pure spiritual priest, but priests were active in social causes and helping people, and he liked that very much. To be a priest, he had to get a degree, so he had to go to college. So he said, I'll go to college. But he didn't have any money to send himself to college after high school. His dad didn't have any money to send him to college, and so he had to get a job. His dad pointed that out relatively quickly, and also he had to start paying board and room. Um, that's what you did when you were out of high school. You're on your own now. You're taking care of yourself. His dad helped him find a job as a bank messenger at one of the most respected banks in town, the Fidelity Philadelphia Trust Company. Lloyd hated the job, but figured that if he saved his money, in 18 months he could save enough to go to a year of college. During that period, in fear of falling behind and in an effort to prepare for the rigors of a college education, Lloyd continued learning through books. He knew he would be taking a psychology class, so before he started his freshman year, he read all of Adler, Jung, and Freud. By the time he started his first semester of college, he was greatly disappointed that his classes lacked the challenge he was seeking, and so he dropped out after only a semester and two days. At this time, the Germans were sweeping across Europe, and Pearl Harbor had recently been bombed. Lloyd knew that he would be drafted, and so decided to enlist in the Army instead. His mother says, if you don't join, if you don't sign up at the recruiter's office, but you sign up at the draft board, that means somebody who would have been drafted won't be drafted. And he felt really good about that, he thought. Ooh, that's a noble thing. I can save somebody from being drafted by signing up at the draft board. And so he did out of inevitability and out of making a noble gesture. Basic training was a hard time for him as he struggled to fit in with his fellow soldiers. After basic training, he was first assigned to an artillery unit, but had difficulty mastering the necessary skills. He was transferred to play the cymbals in the army band. He was excited about the idea of being with musicians and other creative minds, but soon found that he struggled to make any personal connections there as well. Before long, he was transferred from the band to a position as a chaplain's assistant, sweeping up the chapel. And so he's sweeping up the chapel one day, and he sees on a bulletin board an announcement for a new unit that's being formed, and they're looking for linguists, and it was somewhat vague but sounded interesting. And he said, I'll never get it, but he signed up for it, and he did get interviewed, and he did get it. He was transferred from Texas, where he was first stationed, to Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania, about an hour and a half from his home in Drexel Hill. He's thrilled. He's there six months. And he gets wonderful instruction. He learns a lot about Europe and about France and about French. And, and he finds people that he connects with. This is a wonderful time for him. And then at the end of that, six-month training, I found, this, I found this interesting. There's a guy that shows up, and I think he's in a uniform, but he has no rank, he has no insignia, he has nothing. And he interviews everybody who's been through the program, and there were about 50 people who'd gone through the French program. And it's all conducted in French. 
and he asks a wide range of questions. How far is that in kilometers from Paris? Uh, in August, what kind of wildflowers are out in northern France? And there's no report of how he did or what happened. He just interviews everybody and then the same guy goes and interviews the German speakers in German. And uh, Lloyd finds out later that of the 50 French speakers, there were six of them that were chosen for further military training, sort of clandestine stuff. And they're sent to a place called Camp Ritchie in Maryland. At Camp Ritchie, Lloyd underwent intensive military intelligence training. He was being prepared to be parachuted into France to help with the resistance. Lloyd was thrilled to be experiencing this. He was there for six months from March to September of 1944. During that time, the Allied troops invaded Normandy, which would cause a change of plans for Lloyd's unit once they finished their training. Instead of being parachuted into France, he was sent to Wales. Lloyd's time in, in Wales was a very influential period um, because when he was in Wales, uh, in many ways those King Arthur legends came to life for him. Uh, for the first time in his life he saw kind of this, this open, green, rich landscape with crystal clear blue skies and clouds and lakes and castles. He'd never seen a castle before in his life. And uh, it just really brought to life and kind of rekindled in his imagination uh, those great stories of adventure as a youth. After two months in Wales, Lloyd would spend the rest of the war in France and Germany. In early May 1945, Lloyd was sent to Paris. He arrived there on May 6, the day before Victory in Europe Day. Lloyd basked in the celebrations and then enjoyed living and learning in Paris for the next year. I joined the army, which seemed a good thing to do at the time, and went uh, through the war in France and Germany. Got sent back to Paris, which is a marvelous thing to happen, uh, for a couple of reasons. First, Paris is a great place to be, and secondly, uh, I met my wife Janine there. Janine Denis was a single mother struggling in war-ridden France to provide for herself and her young daughter, Mado. Lloyd and Janine, it's, it's quite a love story when you think about it. Here's uh, an American GI in Paris after the war, and uh, as I read the story, he was uh, driving a Jeep through a very rainy French night and uh, saw a beautiful young woman uh, in the, stuck in the downpour of the rain and he had offered her a ride. And uh, she accepted and that's how Lloyd met Janine. And obviously Lloyd was smitten enough that he now knows where she lives and comes back and uh, sees her again and then again and he takes her places in Paris she's never been before and he overcomes his natural shyness and that's what happened. Lloyd and Janine were married on January 8, 1946, in Paris, France. They lived there for a few months while Lloyd was going to school at the University of Paris. In March of 1946, Janine and Medeau sailed back to the United States on a ship full of war brides, and two months later, after finishing some more school, Lloyd would join them. This period would be a stressful one for the young Alexander family. However, it started out hopeful as they planned to live with Lloyd's parents and survive off the money he was getting paid by the United States government as a returning soldier. This would allow Lloyd to focus on writing and pursue his dream of becoming an author. And so he's saying, I'm with my folks, my wife and daughter are here, I can write, and by the end of this year when my money runs out, I will have things accepted for publication and I'll be on my way. Alexander works like a bandit, always has. He writes 12 hours a day, seven days a week. He doesn't take weekends off. Halfway through that year, nothing's really happening. He starts to get a little concerned that he's not going to have an advance against royalties and then royalties checks coming in 
And so toward the end of the year, he figures he's got to get a job. And he gets, he looks around and, and, it's, and he gets a job. But he can't write his 12 hours a day because he has to go to work. So he would come home from work and he'd write till midnight. He'd still write six or seven hours a day after putting in a full day at the office. And, um, and he kept writing and he kept not publishing. They were living in the crowded attic of his parents' home, and Janine was having a hard time adjusting to life in America. Around this time, Janine found out that she was pregnant. Lloyd and Janine decided it was better for their family if they found a place of their own. They found a modest home not far from where his parents were living and settled in as they anticipated the growth of their family. However, in November of 1950, the baby was stillborn. They were devastated. Lloyd continued to write every evening after coming home from work and all day on the weekends. This went on nonstop for seven years without any success. At this point, he started to slip into a deep depression. He uh, was at the end of his rope. Had he not been working so hard, it would have been easy to say, well, I can change this. He's working every day. He's not cutting any corners. He's doing all he knows how. He's not getting published. And he, uh, he alluded to the fact that he may end things. Um, his life is not turning out how it should be. He doesn't know what else he can do. Seven years is a long time to be working at least seven hours a day, and on weekends, 12 hours. He's saying, what's gone wrong? What else can I do? Um, maybe th this, I'm not cut out to be what I think I was cut out to be. In desperation, Lloyd took a final look at his writing and realized that he had been trying to write about subjects that he knew nothing about. He needed to write about something where he had first-hand experience. He thought back to his time working as a bank messenger after high school and decided to try writing a book about those experiences. Finally, in 1954, he found success. And Let the Credit Go was published, and Lloyd Alexander had reached his goal of becoming a published author. He continued to have success writing about his life experiences, and in 1956 published his second book, this one about his cats. There's always some cat in each of his books, and there's also My Five Tigers, which is his book about the cats, which is wonderful. And of course, as, as you know, he wasn't a cat person originally, and he became a cat person. He was very devoted to the cats in a way that I think surprised him and became a very deep pleasure to him. So the cats were always part of everything. Lloyd's success continued in 1959 when he wrote a book about his wife and her struggles adapting to the American culture. It's basically Janine doing Janine things, which kind of flummox everybody around her, including Lloyd. And it's done with great delicacy. It's done with great humor. He talks about the shopping lists that she makes, and they're just utterly bizarre. She, I, I remember where she put something on the list, it's like, it's like crunchy pillows, and he has no, or something like this, and he has no clue what it is, and it's shredded wheat. But the book is very, it's, it's tender. It's a very loving, funny book about this relationship. And you really like her. I mean, you, you identify with, with the Lloyd character but you just, you come to love her as much as he does. It's, it's a pretty great book. It's much harder for her adjusting to the United States than anybody anticipated. She doesn't speak English. Uh, it even gets worse because the parents who don't speak French know somebody who married a French girl after World War I and she came to the United States. 
And so they bring her over to the house to make her feel better. Hey, I came, I married, I'm here, it's gonna work out fine. Made it much worse. She wrote Lloyd and said details like, she is fat, she's forgotten her French, she wears too many bracelets. It was worse seeing her than not seeing her. And she just keeps going, she goes downhill. And in fact, as an aside, until the day she died, Janine had a strong French accent. I think it's because they brought this woman over and she, Janine, is not gonna lose her French. And she didn't. She was so hungry during World War II and her child was hungry. So when she um, had her own home, she fed all the stray cats, she fed the birds, the squirrels, everything. Somewhere along the way, she told me that she'd promised God that if she ever had enough, nobody would ever be hungry around her. And then at the end of her life, she said to me, I kept my promise. Although Lloyd continued to have success writing for adults, his work wasn't quite fulfilling. He didn't feel that he was the author that he wanted to be and hadn't found the way that he could truly express himself through his writing. And for some reason, after about 12 years of writing for grown-ups, I don't understand why this happened. It was a marvelous thing to happen. It seemed to me that whatever it was I wanted to say, and I didn't even know what it was I wanted to say, but whatever that was, it seemed to me that the best way I could say it was through the form of the so-called child's book. So in the early 1960s, Lloyd entered a new era of his life. His first children's fantasy novel would come from an idea that he got while observing one of his cats. There was one cat called Solomon, particularly, that would come in to where he's working, and Lloyd's working, and then he reaches down to touch Solomon, and he's gone. And he, he vanishes. And Alexander's thinking, cats have nine lives. Do, do they have to spend all of their lives here in my house? Couldn't they have a life they spent somewhere else? And imagine Solomon going to a different place to lead a different life, and then he puts them in historical periods. And to make the book work, he has a young boy, which seems to work better. And he can take the boy with him to ancient Egypt or to ancient Ireland. And so he ends up writing a book called Time Cat, where there are nine chapters where a cat takes his young master to nine different places historically. He wanted to set one of the chapters, which would be one of the historical periods in the cat's life, um, in Ireland, uh, dealing with St. Patrick. What he discovered in his research was that Patrick was really Welsh rather than Irish and even that his uh, name in Welsh meant good cat, which was sort of an irony. So he decided to set it in Wales instead for that reason, but as he began to dig into the history of Wales, especially the mythological history of Wales, he found it was so rich, and again it began to ignite his memories of being in Wales during World War II which was for him a magical, a magical few weeks. Uh, he, he just thought to himself, this is far too rich and far too deep for one chapter. And so he decided to put the chapter back into Ireland, still with Patrick, um, and save what he had found out and actually remembered about Wales for another project. Lloyd decided to write a trilogy titled The Sons of Lear, which would be a retelling of Welsh mythology. And thus the mythical land of Prydain was created. He sent me this first chapter and it was awful. It was filled with dragons flying around and it was just totally 
so far out. And I said, Lloyd, come on, make it something kids would want to read. Grab them and start. First sentence should be something like, Taran wanted to make a sword, which of course is what the book ended up having is the first sentence. In 1964, the first book in the trilogy now called The Chronicles of Bredain was published under the title of The Book of Three. The publisher Holt had been so enthusiastic about the book, they had done a larger print run than usual, um, and I think they, uh, whenever, whenever a publisher gets behind a book, they obviously do more PR for that book. And so I think it got a bit of a leg up, um, and uh, the reviews were very positive. As you know, it, it was an American Library Association notable children's book for that year, which certainly means that it was well received by the reviewing public. So um, it, it, uh, it, yeah, I think it gave the series uh, a, a good start because it just picked up steam after that. The second book, The Black Cauldron, was the book that Lloyd called the easiest book he ever wrote, saying that it practically wrote itself. It received a 1966 Newbery Honor as a runner-up for the Newbery Medal, America's most prestigious children's book award. As Lloyd started to write the third and final book in the trilogy, he realized that he needed to revise his original plan for the series. A trilogy wouldn't be enough, and a fourth book was needed to tell the story. As uh, Lloyd was working on the third book, he just had the strong feeling that uh, he wasn't going to be able to conclude this in the third book. And so the fourth book began uh, to arise in his thinking, and eventually uh, he did move on to a fourth book, which was at that time titled uh, The High King of Perdane, I think. And, um, and so, as we know, he uh, worked on that fourth book even before the third book was completed. At this time, Lloyd was working at a day job at the Delaware Valley Industry Magazine as an associate editor. One day as he was working, he was wandering downtown Philadelphia during his lunch break and had what he would call a near-death experience. He um, stopped by a construction site, building a new big building in downtown Philadelphia, and he watched a wrecking ball on its chain swinging back and forth above him, and then went back to work. Then the very next day, as he looked at the newspaper, there was an article about a wrecking ball that had broken its chain and fallen to the sidewalk below. And as he looked closely, he discovered it was the same building that he was watching being constructed. And not only that, the spot where the wrecking ball hit was the exact spot where he had been standing the day before. And suddenly, his uh, lovable pessimism kicked in and he thought, that could have been me. Now what you have to also understand about Lloyd is he had this great sense of responsibility to his readers. And he realized that if he didn't finish Perdane, the Perdane series, nobody could step in and do it. Lloyd quickly wrote The High King of Perdane to end the series. He sent the manuscript to his editor, Anne Durrell, and as she read it, she felt like something was wrong with it, but couldn't determine what it was. On an August night in 1965, she awoke around 2 a.m. and realized what the problem was. An entire book was missing. He sent me the last one, and I said, Lloyd, there's a book missing. Because the first chapter referred to Taryn having this adventure and year and so on. I said, hey, you didn't write that book yet. He said, oh, and then he went to work and wrote Taron Wanderer. The series was finished in 1968 when the fifth book was published. 
In 1969, the High King won the award that the Black Cauldron had narrowly missed three years earlier, ALA's John Newberry Medal, the award for the best children's book in America that year. He finished the High King and he himself says that it, it was almost like having a death in the family, that he felt such a sense of loss. Uh, and it began to depress him a bit. Plus, you know, he was going to have to face moving on to something else when he really wasn't quite ready to leave his magical kingdom. Um, and he began to feel like, well, maybe I'll never do any, anything good again, you know, and so on and so forth. And then the call comes uh, for the Newberry. I think that for Lloyd, winning the Newberry uh, helped him overcome that sense of depression he was having at finishing Perdane. Um, and as he said, in his own words, he said, um, it was certainly good for the morale and it helped him move forward. The Chronicles of Perdane was one of America's first high fantasy series. In addition to the five books, Lloyd also wrote two picture books based on Perdane. And in 1973, he published a compilation of short stories about Perdane. In all, the series would be Alexander's most successful works, finding fans around the world. I had read the Chronicles of Perdane when I was in fifth grade, and they were my first experience with any kind of fantasy literature. I'm not talking about children's literature where you have Stuart Little or Chitty Chitty Bang Bang or Charlotte's Web or, or any of those books where you have talking animals. Lloyd's stuff sort of put you up on a higher level. It's almost like, a, it's almost like the sort of pathway into the door of classic fantasy. And I read that when I was 10, 11, and loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. Loved it. And it stayed with me, although I didn't reread it for years. I think another thing that's important to realize is that it was um, one of the most influential high fantasy series in American publishing history. I think it will remain being uh, extremely important in the realm of children's literature and literature in general for that reason. First of all, they're set out of time and they're, um, everything about them it, nevertheless is very real and very present. It's very human. These are great themes and they're wonderful characters and they're a lot of fun. Too. I mean, they're not pompous. They're good, engaging stories. You could really give them to a kid. And I have, and I love them. I think of all of the books that I read as a child, and I read a lot <laughs> as a child, um, Prydain plays a significant role in, in, you know, major points in my life, um, and major points in my development and my, um, my outlook for the future and, and becoming who I am today kind of kind of pathway that it led me on was was really very much shaped um, by Prydain. I went home on a break and I found the Chronicles of Prydain, which I hadn't read since I was a child. And I just picked it up casually just to kind of look at again at the cover and I opened up the book of three and I just started reading the pages and pretty soon I'd read the whole book. And then I went right to the Black Cauldron and read that one as well. And I had to go back to school before I'd had time to finish it. And so I went into the, their school library and I illegally checked out those books because you weren't supposed to check out children's books there unless you were a children's literature major, which I was not. And it made me realize that I could still love children's books. I could still learn from them. I could still get lost in them, even as an adult. And that opened a door for me in what I could write. With Prydain, Lloyd felt like he had finally found a way to express himself. He felt that he had now discovered how he could examine the human condition through his writing and how to really affect his readers' hearts and minds. Prydain was 
just such a revelation for children's books that there could be this long sustained um, multi-book uh, story that didn't take place in the world of the here and now and also wasn't a, a fairy tale per se but was an epic yet it was peopled with characters who were confronted with things and did things and acted on things that spoke of their humanity and were tremendously translatable to um, modern children. Those things that Taryn encountered were things that young people encounter every day. Unlike a, a lot of authors, I was not writing uh, for any specific child. I wasn't writing uh, for my daughter, for my uh, nephew, or somebody down the street. I was writing for myself uh, as, as a very expressive and profound art form. And this is how it turned out to be, that I found myself able to deal with things uh, that I could never even uh, express writing for adults. And this may seem quite surprising, uh, that you think a book for young people, uh, no, you can't deal with, uh, with serious things uh, uh, far from it. Uh, I found I could deal with uh, much more serious, much more profound things uh, than I could ever do writing for grown-ups. In the 40 years after Padain, Lloyd continued to write and successfully published over two dozen more books. And while he wrote about many things, including his love of cats, his love of music, and foreign lands and traditions, one theme remained constant throughout all of his books. Why we are the way that we are, and what we can do to improve the world that we live in. This was the message that he wanted to share from the beginning. I want to be the war and peace in Philadelphia writer and examine the human condition and touch people's hearts and minds and let us engage with life and learn as we're having a good experience with the book. Lloyd thought a lot. He thought he didn't do anything lightly. I think that his curiosity was always there. I think he always wanted to do better. I think you know, you sort of laugh at humans and cry at humans and try to do better as a human. And I think that the thing that I love about his work is that it illuminates the human condition and how you can learn from the most unexpected sources. And he manages to pull it off in a way that's both hilarious and heartbreaking. His books have a moral center that is, um, profound and just. His books are metaphors for, for life, for j the journey that, that you need to do right in this world, that you need to be kind and you need to work to uh, vanquish evil, which can come in various ways. Um, and in, in his epics, it, it does come, um, like in other epics, um, with the threat of the dark forces taking over humanity with humanity's goodness. So I think Lloyd really, he profoundly believed in the epic struggles. And, and he felt he had to write, you know, he felt he had to write about them um, and give that back to, give that back to children. Lloyd continued to suffer with depression for most of his adult life. In addition to the period of depression when he was first struggling to get published, 
He had a particularly dark period of depression during the mid-1970s. He always doubted that he could write another book. That bothered him greatly. He finishes a book, but it doesn't make the next book any easier. I know that The Wizard in the Tree has strong biographical elements in it. The wizard is losing his power. The wizard can't perform like he has performed before. There were two periods in his life that you can identify as being strong depression. One is when he's written seven years, and the other is in the mid-70s when he's doing The Wizard in the Tree. He suffered from clinical depression. And as he often told me, it would take him weeks to recover and it interfered seriously with his work. After dealing with his depression for many years, he found a way to use it to benefit his creativity and create books full of emotion. He did suffer from it all his life, but he never took any drugs or anything to treat it. I, I think he thought maybe his, his demons were good for his writing, so he sort of, embraced his depression, if that makes sense. He was depressive, and he did have, um, he did have mental difficulties, but I think that the fact that he, I wouldn't say he overcame his depression, but that he used it, he used it he suffered seriously from depression, and he was afraid to. I would beg him, I had been in therapy and it did so much for me. I would beg him, to, I even got the name of a good therapist in Philadelphia. He was afraid to because he was afraid he would lose his writing edge. If he, he thought his depression and <laughs> craziness, I guess, was what he used to write, and um, he was afraid of losing it. Despite all of the challenges that he dealt with throughout his life, Lloyd Alexander always found a way to rise above them and become better. You know, one thing that stands out from Lloyd Alexander, as opposed to many other modern authors today, is um, in some ways, he didn't fit in. He didn't really feel like he fit in at school. He didn't fit in at college. Uh, he volunteered for the army, but in some ways he felt he didn't fit in there. Um, he was a very unique individual in many ways, in both his nature and uh, uh, the way he uh, mannered himself and spoke to people and helped out people. Um, but it, it's more for me uh, kind of a lesson that if you're one of those people that doesn't fit in, um, it's okay. And you've each got your own unique gifts that you can share with people. And that's certainly what Lloyd Alexander did. In a career that spanned over seven decades, Lloyd Alexander wrote 48 books, including eight picture books and four translations. He won numerous awards and was translated into over 20 languages. He wrote to the very end of his life. His final book, The Golden Dream of Carlo Ciuccio, was published in 2007, just months after he had passed away. He said, and I really believe he meant this, that if he were given this choice, this is what he would choose. Here's the choice. You can live out your natural life without interruption, but you got to quit writing. That's choice A. Here's choice B. You can write one more book. Good, bad, indifferent, you can write a book. As soon as it's finished, when the last page is done and the last period is put on the paper, you will die. What would you choose? He says this to himself. He said, it's not even hard. I'll take the book. And he really meant that. 
because there are things that are bigger than he is and he acknowledges that and being able to write is one of them that was his life he actually retired when he retired from the last magazine that he worked for and from that point on he was able to do what he wanted which was write and um it was as essential to him as breathing. As Lloyd approached the end of his life, he knew his time was limited, and that became apparent in his writing. Anne Durrell did think that the rope trick was when the main character, whose name I can't remember, finally does the rope trick and disappears. It's the magic and the prose which allow him to leave this world. Um, she did say that she thought that was Lloyd's kind of say, starting to say that he knew he was coming to the end of his, both his writing life and his life. And the scenes in the burial ground of, um, that take place in the burial ground in the Iron Ring, are, I mean, I wept when I read them because I knew that Lloyd was writing a, about death and transfiguration in a way that he hadn't actually ever really done it done before, and the way he had been, he, the way he was thinking about that was, I, it definitely came about from his own the course of his own life. After he finished um, Carlos, the, his last book, he said, um, I finished my work. I finished my work. Lloyd said to me one time, we were talking about death, and he said that people's reaction to death is not yet, not yet. You know, there's always something you want to do. So it's not yet. And so I felt like when he said, um, I finished my work, that he knew the not yet was, was not being put off any longer. One of the things that surprised me and impressed me was the fact that even when he was so ill, and he at that point couldn't even speak, his voice was gone, he couldn't speak, uh, he was still. Uh, driving hard, as, as he always did, to finish his last project. And just a few days before he died, the final book was finished. Lloyd Alexander passed away on May 17, 2007, only two weeks after the death of Janine, his beloved wife of 61 years. He continues to have a tremendous impact after his death. Every year, hundreds of school children in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, participate in Lloyd Alexander Day at Arlington Cemetery and visit the final resting place of Lloyd and Janine. Upon his death, he donated many of his belongings and papers to Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. On campus, there is an exhibit which recreates his home office and displays many of these belongings. Students, researchers, and fans go there to learn more about him. Even though Lloyd Alexander is primarily known as a children's author, he really didn't use the device of writing for children as a type of a crutch. He didn't write down to children. Uh, what he did in his books, all of his books really, is tell a story, in many ways a universal story, from within about human nature. They are great stories, they have great character and great heart. And that's what I think anyone who's looking for a good read should take some time to find out more about Lloyd Alexander. The main thing were the books, and there they are. Anyone can read them, they're there. And um, I think it's great that he wrote, and I'm glad I could enable him to do so. What Lloyd's private life was is uh, his and it is what is in the books that counts and that's what will survive 
because I think the very best part of himself is in those books. These books have the ability to sort of get under our skin and become part of us. Where There are lots of books that I read and like and enjoy that don't do that. And he somehow, by locking into these themes and making them so credible, um, he gets that result from the people who read them. Lloyd Alexander tells stories that are adventurous and fun to read, but at the same time provide layers of, of questions and complications that for someone who wants to look uh, deeper can be really exciting. And that is a high bar that he set that is one that <clears throat> I always keep in mind when I'm writing as well. I'm really so sorry he's gone. I, I miss him. I will have times when I'm sitting with my mind kind of uh, roving around, not thinking of anything in particular, and Lloyd will pop into my head, and I will feel, again, that great sense of loss. I miss being able to talk to him regularly. If I look at my life, both professional and personal, he has been an extremely important part of it, um, an extremely important part of it. and. Uh, and even though he's gone, will continue to be. Will always continue to be. He was one of the most intelligent, generous, and most remarkable people that has been, ever been my privilege to know. I feel as though I've been uh, given a very special uh, treat to have known him and to work with him. He was one of my uh, heroes in a way, sort of an art hero, if you like. You can enter his, his uh, writing with any book and then you are off and running. I don't think that you can uh, read, I don't think a child can read him without falling in love with his book and then uh, branching out into the rest of his, his writing. To me, one of the great things about Alexander is that he doesn't just write high fantasy. He writes such diversity that one of the things I really like about him and one of the things that I think a variety of people can like about him is that he does write diversity. He writes light fantasy, he writes more adventure fantasy, he writes historical fantasy, you know, he writes a great variety. And so I found him to be a great entry point into the genre for a lot of people. Lloyd always said that gesture of putting the book into the hand of the child can change that child's life and he said and here I am at my desk here you are at your desk you know here are all these people you know 20 years later we don't we did that we were part of that but we we don't know about it but that's why Lloyd that's why Lloyd went to his desk every day because he had stories to tell and he wanted to have that effect on children's lives. Lloyd Alexander was every bit as terrific as his books. He was generous, he was funny, he was warm-hearted, he was thoughtful, he cared a lot about people, especially the child reader. There are authors who you meet them and their books are never quite the same for you because they haven't lived up to the picture you may have in your head of who they are, but Lloyd lived up to everything. I loved him very much. And I think that if you, if you read the book, you know the man, is what I think. And of course, there will always be people across the world who continue to celebrate his legacy by reading his books. I've always loved to read, but I think those books in particular um, just kind of, I thought those were quality fantasy books that kind of just continued my interest in reading those kind of books and reading other kinds of books and just kind of helped me to explore my world in a larger way. I think it's kind of one of those books that you can recommend to all teenagers who are interested, like who are looking for maybe adventure or mythology kind of things. I compared them both to Fablehaven and to um, the Chronicles of Narnia books because it was kind of similar, yet it was very different and it seemed like very um, 
I don't know, I guess you could put it like in a category with those books, yet it stood out a lot. Just the way that it ended, it kind of went, you know, like what happens afterwards. With the ending, when Turan just goes back to his home, you're like, is that it? Is he done? Is he going to keep doing more stuff? What's going to happen to the pig? You never know. There's one big lesson that I um, took out of the books is that Sometimes the best choice to make is not the easiest choice, and sometimes you really have to make hard sacrifices um, in order to make those um, the um, good happen in the world. I guess it's just um, doing what's right, even when it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, this kind of happens in like a theme throughout all of the books. I learned that. <laughs> The tough trials come along through all your journeys, all your adventures, but you know, if you keep pushing through and enduring to the end, that you can make it and it'll be all right. Chronicles of Perdane, I think, is a good fantasy series that's kind of lost, like, not a whole lot of people have read it as compared to things like the Chronicles of Narnia or like Lord of the Rings. But I think there's a lot of a lot of aspects that, like, the Chronicles of Perdane share with those, but at the same time, it explores um, kind of fantasy and human nature in a much different way in that it's much more, I think, relatable to common people because the main characters are fairly common. They're not really like kings or anyone that's really remarkable that you'd expect these great things to happen to. It's just kind of an ordinary person. And so I think it kind of tells that ordinary people can do an extraordinary things just based on their actions.